Welcome to this edition of Art in Our Life, all about magical helpers can help us in the studio. Ow. <laughs> and sometimes hit us in the bed. Hello, Internet. I am Lorley Gulledge, and welcome to this week's edition of Art in Our Life, live, 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 live. And this week is all about magical helpers and how they can help you in the studio whether you're an artist or you're just at home working as a, you know, an office type, internet, social media, I don't know jobs anymore. <laughs> but whatever you're doing, if you are at home and alone working on your projects, you're actually not alone because I have a lot of experience being alone and I can tell you that you can use your imagination to help you get through it. So today is a, I forget which, event this is on my virtual book tour. It's, uh, I don't know, it's the millionth video. But welcome to uh, this latest stop where we are celebrating my new book, The Dark Matter of Mona Star. Um, and I'm sharing tidbits of wisdom with you on the way that are inspired uh, by the book. And so actually, uh, one of my magical helpers is a really subtle character in the book because the book is all black and white this graphic novel but i have a bit of spot color in there of this yellow and the yellow is actually representing my genius which is one of my magical helpers so i'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, my magical helpers play into my work as well as in in the studio like how they help me because i really like to try to use my imagination to my advantage as much as possible because it's free, it's available to me, and it's like a huge, I don't know, it's a huge powerhouse of, um, yeah, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> this is why I created cards. Okay, so, oh, before I dive into things, just in case you want to get your own copy of The Dark Matter of Mona Star, you can visit my website. Ooh, ah, .com. I'm sending out orders every Friday. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna talk mostly about how to create a fictional assistant, and then I'm gonna also touch on the creative genius and how they can help you in the studio, as well as other ways that I invoke magical helpers and other, I don't know, other invisible creatures and friends to help me out when I'm by myself in the studio. Okay, so, hold on, I think I have my teeth. Okay, right. so, about making a fictional assistant. Well, I think we've all had the fantasy of having somebody else handle all the messy logistics of our life for us. I know I've had that fantasy, so I can just focus on making art and doing the important work that I feel like I want to be doing rather than boggle down with all the emails and the social media and, you know, pretty much most of the stuff that I do. And I think it's a great fantasy. Like, I know part of the reason I was disillusioned when I first got into books is that I thought that certain things like, oh, an agent will do that for me or my publisher will do that for me. And actually, they do some stuff, which is awesome, but pretty much mostly it still depends on you because no one tells you that being an artist is running your own business, that's being an entrepreneur. It means that you're basically doing everything in the small business and you wear all the hats. So let's say, you know, I want to work in the studio and create art. So yeah, so I got that hat on, but also I have to respond to like all the emails. So I'm like the secretary and then I'm also like the publicist. So I'm out there like hawking my wares and being like, buy my book. Uh, and then I'm the one who like the office manager. So I'm like, oh, we're almost out of stickers. We got to order more stickers. So you're doing all the things. So it can be hard to focus on your creative side of your work if you're also thinking about all these other roles that you're playing. And so it can be overwhelming. In fact, it can barely stay on your head. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's also challenging because when you are wearing all these different hats, um, it can make it hard to know when you're working and when you're not working. So like when I work from home, it can be hard to know when you stop and you put your work aside for the day and you actually pivot to living because sometimes you can, you know, it just spills over and then you're working until midnight. 
because also when no one is telling you what to do, it can be hard to know when you're done and when, so I think that it's great if you like love your job and you love your work, but yeah, sometimes it can spill over into your real life. So like when I was working on Will and Wit, I didn't take any days off a week and it was, so then I was just working all the time and I couldn't sleep. My insomnia was really bad. So I think having healthy boundaries uh, is helpful when it comes to a, like working from home, especially. And so that's why I created a fictional assistant was sort of to help impose structure and expectations uh, on me. And uh, cause I actually do think that we thrive with someone, not that I want someone to like tell me what to do, but we do thrive with structure. Um, and so with the fictional assistant, whenever I talk about uh, my fictional assistant, whose name Coco, I always get the follow-up questions of what is a fictional assistant? How do I get one? Um, and so that's why I was really excited. This is the first time I've actually talked about it. So sorry if I'm not as streamlined with this content as some of my other stuff, but I'm excited to share it. So where do I get this idea? I actually got the idea for a fictional assistant from my performance artist friend from back in New York days, Yo Smith, who's out in LA. And Yo Smith was sharing a story with us about how she had moved uh, from New York to LA and was having trouble booking gigs because people weren't taking her as seriously because uh, she was like a newcomer to town. So she created a publicist and, a, and an assistant and they're completely fictional. They had their own email addresses. They had their own identities. Like one of them was British and so she had an accent, which don't miss my accents. Uh, <laughs> And the wild thing is that it actually worked. So people communicated through her different alter egos and they did take her more seriously and she ended up getting a real publicist and a real assistant. And so I, my mind was blown because I know the power of my imagination that if I can visualize it, then it can potentially happen in the real world because that's part of how this magic works. But to see that, it's like, well, man, I want an assistant, so I gotta start with a make-believe one, and then maybe one day I will have a for real assistant. Because also, uh, what would that assistant do? So part of why it's like, I wanna create an assistant is I wanna figure out what can I delegate to other people? So if I do have someone to help me out, then I'm sort of carving out a job for them of what are the tasks that me personally, I don't have to do. Like making the art, I have to do that. But when it comes to, I don't know, um, like going through my books and doing inventory, like maybe I don't have to be the one to do that. And uh, so my assistant is here. Oh, do you want to meet my assistant? Okay, she's a little, she's a little shy. Okay, here she is. This is Coco. Hi everybody, I'm Coco the lemur. And uh, so Coco, I've, we, We've been buddies for like four or five years now. Yeah, I think that's about five when you know it. Um, something like that. And I've uh, she wears like a little top hat because your fictional assistant always has to have a whimsical accessory, in my opinion. And uh, and thank you, Juliet, for helping connect me with real life uh, Coco, because Coco is just in my imagination. <laughs> So I hope that one day I can woman fest or humanifest a real assistant, but for now I'll start with Coco. And so why is, why is Coco helpful? Cause obviously this little, this little lemur is not actually going around the studio and doing work for me. Okay. I'm going to, I need to use my hand. So I'm going to put, actually I'll just hold on to her. All right. So, um, why is an assistant helpful? Like I mentioned before, you wear a lot of hats when you are working by yourself, working for yourself, working at home, you're doing all the things. And so I find that I can waste a lot of time in debate mode. Like, well, what am I supposed to be working on right now? And so I'll waste a lot of time in like questioning, debating, um, and second guessing, like what, like what's the best use of my time? And so, uh, my, so I have Coco actually create my schedule each week and she helps by sort of, I put her in charge of all that other stuff. So let's see, let me, I need to use my hand. 
Okay, because I talked about, we sort of, I boil it down to two hats. So one hat is the talent hat, which I have my little crown on because, you know, actually I, this is my, my thinking cap in the studio, my talent hat. So I actually wore this around at McGuffey Art Center a lot while I was working on Mona. Um, and it's because sometimes you need to remind yourself that when you're doing your creative work that you are the talent that oh this like I like pampering myself and treating myself really nicely um, to help me tap into that sort of magical thinking of like yes I can do this and cocoa work that's all the stuff that sidetracks me from the studio so if I'm working and I remember like oh there was that email I was supposed to send ah. um, then like, don't worry, you don't have to write that email right now. Just write it down and Coco will handle it. Um, and so it prevents me from getting sidetracked in the studio so it's easier for me to sort of compartmentalize. And uh, let's see. Yeah, and I find that in addition to helping me stay focused in the studio, it also helps me notice my own working patterns, uh, which I think is helpful, especially if you're not used to working by yourself, like noticing what times of the day am I the most focused on what sort of work versus what are the times of day where I am not focused at all and so I shouldn't even bother trying to force myself to do tasks, which for me is like four to five o'clock, like siesta time. And I also think it's, uh, let's see, do, 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 do. yes, I'm going to, now I'm going to talk about like the two basic hats. So I got my talent hat and my cocoa hat. Cause like I said, you do like a lot of tasks. I boil down all the admin tasks into just the assistant. So that's all cocoa. And then the rest, and so then the, the creative work is me. So the talent work, which is one of hat, this is generally in my schedule, it's 10.30 to 4.30 on weekdays. And this is when I'm doing the really creative work. It's private. Um, and it's more deep dive, deep thinking, like, don't interrupt me. So I rarely will schedule anything during these hours. I try to preserve them because also I want to keep a healthy rhythm in the studio. I don't want to get a second wind after dinner and work until midnight. So I found that I used to work a lot more hours. And I feel like that since I've limited it, because I've noticed that I don't get creative work done, good work after six hours that's really all I can do. So instead of pushing myself to do sort of watered down work, I create like a healthy boundary, like this is the time that we are creative. And I actually found that I create better work with that structure than the putting in just more and more hours. So I'm a big advocate for that sort of creating a container for this is the time I'm supposed to do it. And the cocoa work, generally on weekdays, I do that eight to 10 in the morning. And you'll notice that nothing is scheduled between 10 and 10.30. That is what I call puttering time. So that's my transition time between the administrative, more logical, rational work. Uh, it's more public. It's more focused on what my communications out with the world versus my communications in the, in the internet. So this is about the internet. And talent is all about tapping into the internet, if that makes sense. Um, and this is much more sort of rapid fire, like, okay, just send an email, write this invoice, follow up on this, like, boom, 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 boom. And, uh, and I try to limit it to just two hours because sometimes I can just go in the whole day. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, between t 10 and 10.30, I always give myself plenty of time to pivot between the rational, logical state of mind to then the creative, deep connections state of mind. So that's normally a half hour where I am doing some stuff around the house, maybe tidying up the studio, setting up what I'm going to be working on for the day. Um, so that when talent me shows up at the desk, it's like, oh, look, past tense me has already set the table. Oh, thank you, Coco, because I'm so special and I deserve special treatment. Um, and this also is a time where I'll like maybe go outside and like get some sunlight for a second, or maybe I'll do a little dancing. Maybe I'll hug the cat. Maybe I'll put in some laundry because I think it's really good to accommodate life that we're not robots. We're not going to just start working in the morning and then we won't work all like for eight hours and like you like clock out. Um, so, and I also, Coco also does a shift on Sundays. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Um, so on weekdays, Coco works in the morning and then Sunday, 
Coco puts in like 30 to 45 minutes to plan the following week, which I think is like one of my favorite discoveries for myself to de-stress my life because I used to get really anxious on Sunday evenings back when I was a teacher because I would just be thinking about the week ahead and it sort of would ruin my day off on Sunday because I'm just like worrying about the week ahead. So I actually do my planning for the week Sunday morning like with coffee and music is like a ritual and then the rest of the day I feel so much more relaxed because I know I don't have to do any more cocoa logical work. I can actually sort of check out. Um, so those are the two hats I've boiled myself down to. So I got the, yeah, this is actually more like what, um, like this is my talent hat and this is more considered my cocoa hat. I'll put these on. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Let's see. Yeah, and I think with the talent hat, I think it is really important to treat yourself like you are the talent. Because sometimes you forget, especially if you're just, if you're putting in all the legwork and you're like, oh, I didn't get as many likes as I wanted on this and look at that person. They're, you know, but my assistant treats myself like I'm a superstar. And it actually does kind of help and gives me permission to, I don't know, trust my intuition. Okay, let's see, talk about this, talk about that. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, another reason Coco is helpful with this compartmentalization is that um, I feel like I really thrive when I know that there is a structure. Because as creative people, pe others can assume that we don't like structure, that we like just everything to be freeform and open-ended. But actually, I thrive with structure. So, um, whenever I like write down things on Coco's list and then later me comes in is like, and like, Oh, what did I write down to do? I feel like it gives a certain level of um, like checks and balances. Like I know things aren't going to slip through the cracks because I've designed a system that works for me. Um, and so it makes it easier to let myself get lost into flow and actually make better work. Okay. So how do you use an assistant? I use Coco three ways. I've already talked about, I sort of touched on them already. So I use Coco uh, on weekday mornings, like I already mentioned, sort of my office hours. Um, so if anyone who's emailed me, you'll notice that I generally, it takes me 24 hours to email someone back because I will write it onto the next day's schedule if I get something that comes in. So I find it stresses me out to be, if I don't have to react right away, like, oh, I got to respond to that email. I'll put it on the next day's list. Um, and uh, sometimes if I'm really busy, um, or there's a special event, I'll add an hour of cocoa time after dinner, but that's normally for something more active that's like standing or um, walking around the studio, like packing book orders or something. Um, but that's only when things are like busy. Then Sunday mornings, I'll do 30 to 45 minutes of cocoa time, uh, which is when I plan my week. And, dun, dun, dun. and it's nice because then during the week, I just open, like, I have my like schedule and I'm like, oh, what did Coco plan for me to do this morning? Um, and I feel like it's a, like the, my Coco system that I've devised for scheduling my week. I feel like I could do like a whole video on that. So I'm not going to get into crazy detail. Um, because yeah, also I think that we all will develop things that work for us and I've developed my system over a bunch of years. So it might seem, yeah, it's a bunch. And see, the third way I use Coco is seasonally. So like once a season, like every few months um, in my plant when I'm, you know, um, going through my planner, sometimes I'll do a, t a touch in like once at the beginning of each month, sort of look ahead at the month and like put on my Coco hat. Be like, okay, what things do we want to be doing? Let's write down how we're going to plant seeds for those things. Uh, so I also we'll have like a sit down session like every few months and do like serious long-term planning. Cause I think of my life in chapters and in seasons. Um, and it's almost like a cue. So it's like, okay, I know I'm working on this book tour right now, but then after this book tour, then I'm moving. And then after that, I'm going to be doing some more videos for like classes for kids, you know? So, uh, Coco helps. I feel like giving yourself time to plan is something that we forget to do. So planning time to plan. Uh, and it might seem like a lot of work, but it's actually not, it's less work than go, spinning in circles and debate mode of like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Um, and let's see, and what does Coco do? Oh yeah, Coco, what do you do? Oh yes, my busy little lemur. 
Okay. So I wrote down, this is a list of things I wrote that Coco does, and it was before pandemic, so some of them are less applicable. So, what do you do, Coco? Well, Coco is responsible for writing emails, emails, and more emails, scheduling, making invoices, and following up on payments, writing and pitching proposals for new projects, paying bills, all paperwork and filing. Oh, goody, like taxes. Oh, yes, like taxes. Um, blogging, managing social media, press releases, updating new contacts, sending seasonal email blasts, all promotion, packing and mailing out orders, keeping merchandise and freebies and art supplies in stock, keeping studio organized, keeping websites and resume up to date, setting up and cleaning up art supplies, packing for shows and school visits, creating promotional banners, graphic design. There's a lot of that one lately. I know, it's one of a lot. Uh, creating itineraries for business trips, booking travel, mm. lining up events and appearances, mm. grant writing, bookkeeping once a month, planting seeds, following up on leads, keeping the wheels greased, and tooting my own horn. Toot toot. Wow, that's a lot of work, Coco. I know, you're working really hard. <laughs> so, how can everybody else have a really awesome assistant like me? That's a really good question. Um, if you want to create your own assistant, I have three easy steps, but I have to put you down. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. To make your, how to make your assistant. Da -da -da. So first you need to design your assistant. I have sort of three rules for making your assistant. One is that it should be an animal. Two, they should have a two syllable name. Just because a two syllable name is really good for yelling at them. Um, so, actually, so I got Coco, my partner, Lauren Larkin, her assistant is called Rosie. Um, and the third thing is that they should have a fun accessory, because why not? Because also it's silly. So, uh, maybe it's a bow tie, maybe it's a boa, you know, my Coco, he's got a hat, because of course I'm into the hats. Second is to make office hours for them. I think that if you're new to working from home, it's probably beneficial for you to just create like a work schedule for yourself and post it so it's like for real. So you can help hold yourself accountable and treat it like, cause I feel like we have to like trick ourselves into treating it like a real job when we're at home. Um, so actually posting what your hour working hours are is surprisingly helpful. So for Coco figuring out, well like, well, when is Coco gonna work? Maybe for you, it's just Monday mornings. Uh, maybe it's an hour every morning, you know, figuring out just some block of time where you can just focus on like the admin work and give yourself permission like you don't, yeah, you don't have to worry about all the other stuff, just one thing at a time. And the third thing is create a ritual around it. Because part of what this video is about with all the tapping into the imagination to help us is that ritual is really powerful. So like when I say that I wore this thinking cap around McGuffey on days when I felt like I was struggling, did it help me? Actually, it did help me. Uh -huh. And I did hear like an Invisibilia, Invisibilia episode, not to wore a flashy accessory, did feel more confident because there's something about something like wearing something eccentric or changing your look that does give you sort of permission to be a little amplified version of yourself, if that makes sense. So I know in the past when I've been needing extra inspiration, oh, I'd wear lipstick in the studio because when I wear lipstick, it's sort of my, it's more my extrovert side. It's like my war paint. So I'm like, I'm speaking. Ah. So sometimes in the studio, I'll wear lipstick. Sometimes I will wear a thinking cap. Sometimes wearing fun, magical shoes. Like here's today's magical shoes. I don't know if you can see it in here because my screen is on a delay, um, but it actually can help you, uh, I don't know, tap into this other part of yourself. But your ritual with Coco might not be something wearable. It might be um, making, having tea. It might be listening to a certain type of music or playing records. Um, maybe it's lighting incense. Maybe it's using purple ballpoint pens, you know, or a special notebook. It could be really anything that you make it, but just something to mentally, dealt, like, to separate it and create like a space for it because this is really all sort of about like hacking yourself because I think the creative life a lot of it is tricking yourself into thinking that you can do things um, and so yeah we have to use our imagination to our advantage let's see what's my time left 
And let's see, I'll just give a couple more organizational tips about Coco, and then I'm gonna move on to our creative genius. So when it comes to, so if you wanna make a Coco, I got you your, your three steps. <laughs> I also would invite you to designate a folder, a notebook, uh, some something like a, some sort of, cre I call them creative receptacles, where, so like, I, ha I use a spiral notebook. Um, and so whenever, so I have inside their list. So whenever I think like, oh, I need to remember to think about that or make that or whatnot. So I have a list of lists and it's on one sheet of paper in my spiral notebook. And so I keep everything there because sometimes it can be hard when you have a lot of different ideas, a lot of different tasks and you write them down places, but then you don't remember where you wrote them down and you can't actually use it. So creating a specific receptacle just for all the admin Coco stuff or whatever your assistant is named. Um, someplace where you can actually access it. And on my list, I have seven lists because I don't have like one giant list because that just seems overwhelming to me. Uh, I have it broken up by sort of topic and that way I also, each one sort of fits into a different time of my day. So like the correspondence, so my lists are correspondence, which includes emails, phone calls, texts, snail mail, all that. So the correspondence tasks, those are things that I always do like in the morning. Then there's the promo list. The promo list is all stuff like Instagram, blogs, reposting, things like that. So normally that's something I also will like work on in the morning, even if I don't post it till later. Then there's the, the desk list, which I also, I just put on my schedule is a uh, is coco <laughs> so i just call it the coco list those are all the sort of administrative stuff that's all at my desk but not necessarily email so that's more like creating documents writing pitches doing lesson planning doing other paperwork because i have to keep the internet stuff and it's like a separate category than other desk stuff because you know how it is you go on on like okay i gotta go on a facebook and post share this event but the second I go in there, I forget what I was doing and then it's like 20 minutes have gone by and I'm just not feeling good about myself because I'm looking at what someone else is doing. Uh, so I divide up my tasks sort of by um, like what, yeah, so I have like the, the phone stuff, the internet stuff, email, then more like computer work stuff that's not internet. Then the other three lists are home based, so they're less Coco and they're more sort of um, real life. So I have the errands list, of course, which is very short right now. The think list, which I find I added more uh, only a couple of years ago, and it's really helpful because a lot of times something doesn't, it's not an action step yet, it's something I need to figure out. Like before this book tour, it's like, oh, I need to plan, I need to think about this book tour. So I put it on the think list. So then like after dinner is normally a good time for me to do like the that sort of work where I'm like on the sofa or sitting outside like oh my task is to just think about it and like scheme and write and it's a, it's like planning time to plan it's really helpful so adding that in there that in there is I find a good step because also I break everything down into a million steps so it seems less overwhelming so then it's like oh I just have to do this one piece right now I don't have to do the whole thing um, and the last one is home, which is more like personal projects, chores, and self-care. Because I make sure to schedule my self-care stuff in there so it's not forgotten because it's easy to forget. And um, yeah, so those are the seven lists that I have within my one list. It's correspondence, promo, desk, slash Coco, think, errands, and home. And uh, yeah, the last thing I'll say about organizational tips is I think a lot about time sensitivity. So if something doesn't have to be done this week, I like put it off onto the next week, especially if you are overwhelmed. We gotta be really nice to ourselves right now uh, and take off the pressure of how we, like, well, I used to be able to make three pieces in three days and I'm only made one piece in three days. It's like, well, that's because we have pandemic brain and it's taking more time to do stuff and also things take longer than you think anyway. So I think a lot about past, present, and future me and when it comes to planning, I'll think about the time sensitivity. Like, do I have to respond to that email right now? Can I get back? Will they be okay if it takes me 10 days? Yeah, we got it now. So, gotta be open-minded about that. 
And let's see, I'm gonna, before I hop to the fictional assistant, you know, to the creative genius, I'm gonna check on here for comments or questions. Mm. Oh, Jonathan, three and a half year old daughter who runs the room demands to print out coloring pages. Oh yes, <laughs> hey, she needs a hat. Uh, actually, you could, if you have a kid, you can give them like a specific task to do as like, you know, a personified fictional assistant, but something they could actually do. Like it's your responsibility to get daddy Twizzlers because that's what daddy needs in the studio. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, cause also uh, imagination is helpful for manipulating people, especially small children. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, so next. I'm moving on to the creative genius. Okay. I feel like I talked about the creative genius a lot in the past, whatever many number of years. Um, and I always start by talking about Elizabeth Gilbert, who I think Lauren Larkin just shared her Ted talk. Um, cause I saw this Ted talk, this was years ago. And she pointed out that a genius was not a person, that back in Roman times, a genius was something that an artist or a poet had. Like they could hear this, this guiding spirit, like in the walls, and then could like relay the messages through their art and their poetry. And realizing that the original definition of a genius was not an individual, like, I'm a genius. It's like, no, I have a genius. And it really changed how I thought about myself and my, my art completely, because I always felt like that I couldn't always take credit for things that I made. Cause a lot of times it just felt like this accident or like, I don't know. And, um, and also I felt like that it puts a lot of pressure on the artist. Uh, so having this other, you know, artner in the studio, having a genius there realizing that, Oh, this is a spirit that is connecting me to where the ideas come from, which I'm not here to tell you what that is because I feel like that depends on, you know, your philosophy of life, but I know the ideas are alive. Um, and then my genius is my connector. And it also, it's like the word genie, like they are like helping us manifest things that don't exist in reality, which is really magical. So once I, learned that a genius was not a person, that it was actually a spirit. I was like, oh, it's, I knew it wasn't all me. Uh, and it also is so helpful because it takes off the pressure of the ego, but also now I have another person to talk to in the studio. Cause I talk to Coco sometimes and I do talk to my genius sometimes. Um, and a genius, it might also, you might also consider it your muse or a guardian angel or a guiding light or um, or your genie, or an imaginary friend. So my personal theory about the creative genius is that I think that every kid is born with a genius. I think it's our connection to the thing that's bigger than us. Um, and that kids, like when they're playing by themselves, like who are they talking to? I feel like every kid is born with a little genius. And it's as they're growing up and in school, I feel like that in our effort to grow up, a lot of us push our genius away. So I noticed as a teacher that one reason I really like teaching middle school is because that was the time where I feel like kids lose their genius. Sometimes they lose them earlier, which is really sad. Um, but I definitely pushed my genius away at, you know, after middle school. So like, I have to be an adult now. Cause also I didn't know it was my genius. I really thought I was crazy for a long time. Um, until I learned about that the genius was the separate entity. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm not crazy and I'm not alone in the studio. And it really helps me a lot because all using our imagination to enlist different magical helpers is to help us not feel so isolated and alone. Cause especially if you were working by yourself, there's a lot you can get into some other negative self-talk. So that's why if I have other things to talk to, like if I have like Rory's here, sometimes I'll talk to Rory. So talking to other things and music help me counteract the negative thinking, like the obsessing, like taking over. Cause I'm just trying to take charge of the record player in my head. Um, and using everything I can. So the genius, so my genius is named Jean, 
Jean Genie. Um, let's see. I draw Jean in the book as this sort of rain, not a rainbow, um, as this yellow light, this sort of spot color. So this is a scene where, wait, let me scroll down and make sure you can, that you guys can see this. Uh, so I draw it as like this little sort of shooting star. It's like, you know, inspiring her here and encouraging her to create her art and here her matter is like, because if I'm talking to my genius, I'm not talking to my matter. Uh, so I'm choosing which voice I'm listening to. So actually here, Mona is, shoves her matter like in a jar of ink and is using it to paint. <laughs> uh, and is instead like listening to her genius instead of her matter. Uh, so yeah, I don't get too much into the genius in the book, but I really wanted to put it in there because it's part of my magic healing medicine of what's helped me. Uh, when I was a kid, my genius looked like Garfield for sure, because I was really into Garfield. In my head, I see Jean as this rainbow star. I don't have like, I was gonna make a puppet, but I ran out of time. Um, but he looks like this sort of rainbow star, almost like from Mario Kart. This sort of like, meh, if that, I think that makes sense. Um. <laughs> and uh, here's another, I don't, yeah, I don't have like the best picture of, of Jean. But here's a great example of me drawing. This was a proposal for Sketchbook Dares like long ago, where Jean is shining a light on my inner critics here. Um, because this is also part of what my genius does, is it helps me combat all the negative voices in my head. And I feel like that I have an ally and I have like a cheerleader. Um, and it's surprisingly helpful in the studio, even though it's all in my head because <laughs> also stuff that you think about in your head it does register in your brain as real as stuff that's outside so it's actually not too bonkers um, to use your imagination to help you in this way so um, actually I want to dare you all to draw your creative genius so um, mine you know looks like a rainbow star but also I think it's looked like a cat in the past so you can do it on paper, but a lot of times when I've taught this activity to draw your genius, I have people draw on mirror because I like the, the idea of like drawing what you see in the mirror that is invisible to the naked eye, but you feel like is there. So one woman, uh, she drew this, guy, this sort of like sailor, the sailor guy, <laughs> that this is her genius. She's like, yeah, he's been my genius since that, like I was a teenager. Um, like this character, um, yeah, it's hard to photograph mirrors, it turns out. But then of course, like, here's another example, because um, maybe it's drawing your genius, but maybe it's drawing you and your genius. So here we have a magical cat, which, hello. Um, so there's different ways to approach how you want to represent your genius. Maybe you guys are interacting, maybe you're at your desk and they're like talking to you. Um, and if you're not sure what your genius looks like, okay, I have some, some, in, some encouraging prompts. Okay, so if you're not sure, think about your childhood toys and think about the things that you love to draw as a kid. Like, were you doodling flowers? Were you doodling floating eyeballs? Like, were you doodling robots? Um, tapping into, I think, the childhood connection with creativity and that original spark and passion, I think is the best way to sort of tap into that genius. Uh, even using like kids art materials. And also you could think about uh, your spirit animal or a beloved pet. So I feel like animals are really good, just like with the assistant. Animals really, I think, help unlock magical thinking. Um, and maybe it is a genius or a muse or a mermaid or I don't know, another magical creature like a unicorn so yeah i feel like there's a lot of different directions and honestly like it's whatever you make it out to be because maybe it's not a specific character maybe it's just a shape uh like a little like like a little star in mona okay and when working on your, drawing out your genius i challenge you to also think about what their personality is um because i think that it's a good way to sort of gauge even what your relationship is with your creative process so what 
Are there strengths and weaknesses? Are they playful? Are they serious? Are they nice to you? Um, are they in need of music? Like, I need music to work. So I'm always like, Gene needs a soundtrack. He, Because when I go, when I transition from administrative work to creative work, in that 30-minute puttering period, part of what I'm doing is setting up the table for myself, but also I feel like I'm summoning Gene. Like, I need to create a party. I need to create like this sort of conducive environment for some fun creativity to happen. You know, it's like, okay, I gotta get the right music on because Gene likes music and I need like my hot beverage and my cold beverage and <laughs> um, maybe light some incense. And it's almost like I'm sort of summoning it like, hey, Gene, come on, come, come play with me. Um, so that's what I always feel like that puttering period is. It's like sort of creating, I don't know, some good energy going. So it's like, come on in and you know bow. um and let's see dun, dun, dun. oh and if you wanted to try drawing your genius on a mirror which is really fun you could use lipstick um because I, I just also like drawing on mirror because then you can sort of like get in your drawing but you can also use uh china markers like these wax crayons because they're used for writing on china and uh ceramics they're the kind you know with like the string you peel off and it gets everywhere um so yeah so if you have any of these lying around you can try just as you know one way to draw your genius and yeah let's see I don't see any other questions. So cool. Well, I'm gonna keep on going. Okay, so besides your fictional assistant and your genius, who else is there to help you in the studio when you are all alone? Um, let's see. Yes, because we're using our imagination to empower ourselves, to help ourselves, to hack our ourselves, and to set ourselves up for success. And let's see, okay. The five other ways that I use magical helpers, well, one way is to use a thinking cap, um, which I will use in the studio. <laughs> Only when I really need it. <laughs> and another magical helper I have is, oh, Mr. Duck. I have Mr. Duck over here. Uh, people who have known me for a while have probably seen Mr. Duck's travel adventures because he's who I like to take around on trips with me. Actually, he'd be a good representation of my genius too, actually. Um, and I find, so he's more of an outside the studio magical helper. Uh, I find that he's really great when I'm out in the world or like events and things, because he's like a my sort of whimsical icebreaker, uh, because I can't tell you the number of times I've met people where I'm just like taking pictures with him, because he's sort of like the garden gnome where you travel around and you take them around and you, you know they pose with things and so he's like my outside the studio magical helper icebreaker which really comes in handy actually um but he's he was gonna go on tour so sad i don't know what hmm. so he's less applicable for in the studio even though he, he lives there um but in the studio the other magical helpers that i will utilize are of course the ancestors and the rest of the support system in the healing practices video, I touched on making a uh, magical high five. Um, this is the one that actually hangs in my studio. So it's not a full size, it's like a small handprint that I'd made as a sample for another project. And um, I had finished something and I looked around, there was like nobody else in around. <laughs> but I really wanted to just be like, yeah, I, I did it. Yeah. And that was no one there. So I put this on the wall and then I like high fived it. And it actually really felt better. I was like, yeah. Even though I felt rather silly. But I left it up. And so now sometimes I will like, yeah, I did something. And so I visualized behind this hand the hands of all the people who have my back. Um, I like my my partners, my family, my friends, my ancestors. I just think of like all of them giving me like a super in-depth like high five. Um, and so I challenge you guys as an art nerd dare to create your own magical high five. This is one I did in a recent workshop, um, where there's like, you know, there's like past me, present me, future me, the self love, you know, da, 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 da. I feel like I'm going to do, um, I'm actually going to do the mindful art workshop again as a virtual workshop next month. 
So I'll be announcing more about that soon. It's with the Freelands. So that'll be really cool. This will be one of the activities. Um, but having things in the studio to remind you of all the other people who have your back is really, really helpful. <laughs> so if it's not a high five, it might be, uh, dun, 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 dun. it might be something about your partners. So I have, I've always have an partner poster up above my desk as well, just reminding me of all the different creative collaborators that I have as long as well as like readers and students that because you can feel really alone in the studio so having visual reminders that you are not alone is helpful um, to give yourself that feeling also that of like applause like other people are like proud of me like I am not in isolation um, and so I also have in my studio pictures of my different tribes. So I have like pictures of, um, of readers and students and artners and, uh, I even have like a little altar, like on my desk with some little sacred items. Um, so I feel like having things around you to sort of create an audience almost, a, a visual, uh, version of your support system. It does, I think it's really helpful. Because um, sometimes you're not motivated and it's good to know that other people, you know, that I'm not just doing this for me, that I'm doing this with a lot of other people and for a lot of people too. And, okay. Dun, dun, dun. I think that is all I wanted to mention about that. Because um, I didn't want to get too long in this video. Um, so, I'm gonna, if anybody has any questions, please chime in. I'm trying to go through here. Oh yes, the Artner print is based on Picasso because, you know, steal the best. Um, let's see, how can I see your comment? Why is it just showing me in top comments? Uh, technology, it says there's like a bunch, but I only see like a few. Okay. Okay, I don't know how to read the rest of the comments. I can't see them. Um, I guess if someone has a question, then uh, you can... I, yeah. Uh, I don't know how to see the rest of the comments. Uh, okay. So, I... If you have questions... Oh, wait. Here's a question. What about the tasks that are both genius and fictional assistant tasks. Ah, see, I have them as separate because to me, my genius is in the studio and my, uh, in Coco is more like the, the logistical side. So Coco is not artistic. Coco is more like taskmaster, like, you know, einza, einza, versus my genius gene is more like, we, I don't even know what an email is, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so they're definitely like two distinct personalities, which also can make it helpful using them to help me transition from one type of work to another. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Where do those get scheduled? Well, Coco gets scheduled in the morning and then Genius Jean comes in at like 1030. So I'll do the um, the administrative stuff in the morning with like, okay, cow, cow, type, type, type. Then at like 10 o'clock, it's sort of, okay, we're transitioning. And it's like, oh, cutter time. And that's when I'm like, see ya. And let's see, I don't have a good puppet for, for Jean that I use. There. So then 1030 is like, I'm like, Jean, come here. I need to make some art. And he's like, oh, I'm here. Uh, but then at 4.30 or 5, that's when I'm like, okay, Gene, you gotta go, because otherwise he will stick around all night and prevent me from doing, like, living and, like, sleeping. Um, so yeah, I had to create really healthy boundaries for Gene, too. I think it's the number one thing I've learned with the assistant is that I was working nonstop for years because I was scared if I sent my genius away, it would never come back. Uh, and I think that there need, you just need to trust that if you got a rhythm, 
like, okay, every day, like 1030 to 430, this is when uh, I'm like tuned into flow state. As long as you have a rhythm, then I can let him go and he will come back the next day and we got our rhythm. If you don't have a rhythm, then you get more protective, like, well, I can't stop working because what if I'll never have any more ideas again? Uh, so I think that having that schedule and that rhythm also makes it easier to have a healthy relationship with your genius. So you're not like life boarding them. You're not like, never leave me. Um, because now we have more of a healthy, less codependent relationship. Now I can have relationships with real people, theoretically. Um, so yeah, that was a good question. Um, dun, dun, dun. Any other questions? I hope this has been inspiring for you guys to use your imagination to personify your different tasks, your administrative stuff with an assistant and your creative stuff with your genius. So make it easier for you to be able to, yeah, work on what you need to work on when you need to work on it and then stop and live your life, do your self care and rest because we're not robots and we can only be so productive at this time. Okay, so then let's see, to wrap things up, I wanna share next the next two videos are much more for uh, family friendly, like for kids. These are like my go-to teaching at like comic cons and school visits and stuff. Uh, so next week is making mini comics, um, which I'm gonna be talking about. And when I say a mini comic, I mean like a little zine, like this little guy, like little baby comic. Cause also who has the attention span to make it a 200 page graphic novel? Um, then the next week will be Sketchbook Dare's drawing. Uh, so these are gonna be, I'm gonna be leading activities from Sketchbook Dare's, of course. Uh, I'm gonna be picking ones that also tie in with sort of art therapy, you know, healing this time. Uh, because I think, you know, drawing skills are good, but right now I think using it to tap into emotional intelligence is especially healing. So. So yeah, so if you know of any young artists, please invite them, because these are the two offerings I'm doing that are the most like family friendly. So I'm excited. And let's see. And if you want to um, get a copy of Mona, like I said, go to my website. Oh, and the videos are on Facebook, which you know because you were here watching it on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, to this virtual book tour event and I want to thank Lauren Larkin Scuderi for helping me out as my virtual producer. Uh, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this please consider sharing this video and I hope that you'll consider tuning in next week. And until then I'm wishing you all a very healthy and inspired weekend with I, I am so curious if other people want to create their assistant or genius. If you want to share it, please tag me on social media because I'm wildly curious about what other people's imaginary friends look like. Um, and yeah, I hope that you all stay well, be well, be weird. I love you all. Mwah! And how to close out. Oh wait, I'll show them. Last thing. Last thing is Rory. Rory is my other friend in the studio. Oh, okay. Bye. Oh, he's not very, oh, he's just sleepy, baby. <laughs>